All right, Greg, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm good, I appreciate you taking the time. You know, you've uh, been the, one of the main guys out there. Uh, the murder rap book, could, you know, kind of told the whole story about Tupac and Biggie and everything. And, um, you know, just appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. A question that I see on the internet a lot is people always wonder, uh, was Orlando there when Jake Robles got killed? Nobody knows for sure. Um, according to the best witness in the case, which was the off-duty um, deputy sheriff who was moonlighting as a security guard there, he was one of the guys that broke up the melee between uh, Suge and Puffy's people. Um, he positively identified Orlando in a photo lineup. He looked at the photo of Orlando and said, absolutely, this is the guy that was in the blue jacket, in the powder blue jacket. So that's what we have. We have an eyewitness from a credible source saying Orlando was there. I don't know for sure. I think Keefe D denies it. Um, so it's a big mystery. Oh, okay. Did you guys ask Keefe D when you uh, did the big interrogation? I think so. If I, if I remember correctly, I think we brought it up and he said, no, I don't, Orlando wasn't there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, can you take me through the incident of uh, Suge? making Puffy's friend drink the piss? Again, that's also, that was something that was reported, kind of urban legend. We, don't, we know for sure an assault took place with Mark Anthony Bell at the Christmas party. And uh, um, they're in the police report. It doesn't say that, that he, so this is just kind of information that came about based on other people that were at the party and it, you know, it's one of those kind of things that probably got a little over exaggerated. Most certainly there was an assault that took place involving Dre and Tupac and Norris Anderson and, uh, and, and Suge, among others, when they accosted this guy and beat him up trying to find out where Puffy's people were. Oh, okay. So Tupac and Dr. Dre were both there when it happened? According to the crime report. According to the police report that was made out by Mark Anthony Bell, who was interviewed by both the FBI and the LAPD, uh, those are the people he identified as some of the primary aggressors in the incident. Okay, and, wh and why was Suge going after um, his, this guy? Going after Mark Anthony Bell? Yeah. Because he thought he had information about where Puffy's um, family residence was in L.A. Okay, and around what time, around what time was this? Christmas time, 1995. 95, okay. So this was... Uh right when things started to heat up between? Oh, okay, so this, oh, this is way past the Source Awards. Yeah, so this is 95, but you know, things had been heated up ever since you know, Tupac got out of prison. You know, things had always been hot. And after Jake Robles got shot and killed in Atlanta, things were even worse. And so you know, there, was a, you know, there was ongoing confrontations and incidents that just kept fueling the fire. And that was just another one of them. Oh, okay, okay. And, um, okay, so the first time Puffy mentions going after Pac and Suge, he did it uh, after um, a show in Anaheim? According to Keefe D. Okay, can you take me through that? Yeah, they were all at a show, and uh, Keefe D and, and some of uh, Puffy's people, a bunch of Southside Crips, were all at this hotel. And uh, that's when, according to Keefe D, Puffy makes this kind of announcement that you know, that he needs some help in this situation and, you know, kind of one thing led to another. Okay, was uh, Biggie there? I don't know. Okay, but it was just a bunch of KPD and his homies? Yeah, because they were, they were kind of tagging along, being part of the bad boy crew as they came to L.A. because Puffy knew he already had friction with Suge. This was his territory, this was his backyard, and so he had, a, you know, aligned himself with these Crips because they had a... Um, they were kind of the natural enemies of Suge Knight and, and uh, people from Death Row. Okay, so okay, so this time Puff is stressing about everything. He's uh, got everything. You know, he's worried that something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, what happens at the second time he actually gets serious with Keefe D? Well, the second time, uh, I believe, was at Greenblatt's up on, the, up on Sunset, and Keefe D says that uh, Puffy pulled him aside, and basically solicited um, his assistance to take care of, of uh, 
Suge. And then, of course, Tupac's name came up, and he was kind of added to the list, according to Keefe D. And uh, that's when there was a kind of a very vague discussion over money. And next thing you know, Las Vegas happens. Okay, so um, so at this point, um, they get back, they get back from uh, Vegas, and um, Monday comes around, and Puffy calls, um, I believe Zip on Monday, and they meet up. Keefe D said the following day. So if the fight was Saturday night, it could have been in the afternoon of Sunday, or you know maybe Monday. Okay. And, and can you take me through that? Yeah, he says they're at the wing spot up on Melrose, and um, he's with Zip, and the phone rings, and uh, it's Puffy on the other end of the line, and he asks the question, was that us? And what did, did he say anything? Well, who, Keefe D? Yeah. Talking to Puffy? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he affirmed it. Yeah, that was us. In his book, he says, Faith called Zip right before Puffy called. Okay. Is there anything to that? No, except that, you know, Faith understood the dynamics of all of these relationships. You know, Faith knew that, um, that Zip, she was close with Zip, obviously. And when she would come to L.A. and these gangsters would be around, Zip would tell her, you know, these guys are just here kind of, don't worry about them. They're just here as basically security or part of the crew. So it would have been natural for her to draw the conclusion after seeing what or hearing about what happened in Vegas that it had something to do with that. Okay. So it, she, out of curiosity, may have called and just been like, what the f what's happening? Uh, is there any, any, proof, any proof that Biggie knew anything about no. what was going on? There's none. So people can speculate, and maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but we don't have any proof one way or the other. Okay, so I, so I seen you mention um, in, in one of your interviews or one of the, the documentaries, you had said that Tupac found out that Big and Puffy didn't set him up. Do you know how he found that out? I don't know other than talking to people and finding out that, uh, that it was, you know, this other crew having to do with... Uh, Jimmy Rosemond, James Roseman, Jimmy Hinchman, um, and then realizing that, okay, yeah, this has something to do with something entirely different, and, uh, you know, kind of back down from that initial response that he thought they'd set him up. Can you take me through the Biggie case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so after Las Vegas happens, of course, Suge Knight ends up getting his um, probation revoked and goes back to prison, so now he's in jail. Um, you know, six months have gone by since Tupac's shooting. Um, Tupac obviously dies um, on the 13th. And the rumor starts to go out that what happened in Vegas, maybe Biggie had a hand in it. You know, he provided the gun, he had hired these Southside Crips, he was in Vegas. It was all erroneous information, but again, this is rumors that happen on the street that people then begin to accept as truth. And so Keefe D and his crew um, are distancing themselves completely from uh, the likes of Puffy Combs because, you know, they all know that they've potentially been in this murder conspiracy together. The feds are breathing down everybody's necks. Law enforcement's all over the place asking questions. So everybody's just trying to lay low. Well, six months goes by and Puffy and Biggie and all of them come out to Las Vegas and they're thinking everything's calmed down. Suge's in jail. Tupac's dead, and they're just trying to, you know, continue, um, you know, with their music and their, and their promotional stuff. And so they came out here with a false sense of security, and uh, they ended up at the Peterson Auto Museum. Unbeknownst to them, Suge Knight is already plotting to retaliate. So he gets a girl that he can trust to act as an intermediary, as a messenger because he's in jail. She visits him in jail. They have a discussion. He says, this is what I want done. Reach out to this dude who I know will do it. And she does just that. She secures a payment. And the three of them conspire to shoot and kill Biggie. The night of the shooting, um, Wardell Faust, the hitman, shows up, lays in wait, and ultimately shoots and kills Biggie. OK. Um, Poochie, right? Mm -hmm. 
And um, is there any evidence that anybody else was involved? There's no evidence that anybody else is involved other than the three of them. However, um, there's a reasonable um, there's a reasonable idea that maybe there was another person that would have helped to set him up, but we just don't know. We don't have the evidence to support that allegation or claim, but it's likely somebody else was acting as a spotter and helping Pucci get the right guy at the right time. Uh, okay. Can you take me through how you got KPD to cooperate? <clears throat> yeah, it's the kind of typical investigative strategy where you get somebody to where um, you have leverage on them. And once you have leverage on them, you introduce the scenario to them and let them make a decision whether or not they think it's in their best interest to cooperate. That's essentially what we did. Built a drug case against him that was going to put him potentially in jail for the rest of his life and said, you know, here's your opportunity to mitigate that situation and tell us the truth about what happened in Tupac's murder or Biggie's murder, whichever you happen to be involved in. And uh, he agreed, as a lawyer agreed, and there was a formal agreement between the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and KPD's attorney and sat down and started the process of cooperating. And he enlightened us to the details as far as he knew them. It's a very complicated prosecution, you know, based on the fact that so much time has passed. You know, we don't get that information until like 2009. Um, a lot of the witnesses and co-conspirators were dead. Uh, Keefe D's a convicted drug dealer, a known gang member. He's perjured himself before, so his own credibility will be in question. And now you're taking his information, and he has immunity in regard to his own confession. And so now we can only go after co-conspirators, all of whom die with the exception of Puffy. Puffy now is, um, you know, an iconic music figure with hundreds of millions of dollars. And you're not going to have a very practical likelihood of prosecuting him based solely on the testimony of a known drug gang member, convicted drug dealer, ex-convict, and who has changed his story several times. So the prosecution in Las Vegas realizes that this is, you know, most likely never going to result in a, a conviction. Just don't have the credibility in the witness to bring this forward, and that's the problem with it. Uh, okay. Does anybody know what happened to the gun? No, not for sure. Nobody knows exactly what happened to the gun. What happened, uh, uh, Keefe, did you say they went back? What, or what happened when they went back to the white Cadillac? Keefe didn't go back to the white Cadillac. He went home by other means. So the white Cadillac and the gun was um, managed or, or handled by the rest of the crew. So Keefe D wouldn't have had any direct knowledge of what happened unless he heard from one of those guys. And he didn't disclose to us what, what happened. Okay. What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam Capone News.